Hello, and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is a Canon EOS 1000F, sold between 1991 and 1993. Uh, it cost around about £300, including a 35 to 80 what you might call today a kit lens. Uh, this is not a kit lens, obviously. This is an earlier 3570, uh, which is perhaps optically a little bit better than that, uh, that 3580 would have been. But nonetheless, for £300, what a lot of camera you got. It really does have uh, all the bells and whistles. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. And as ever, let's start by putting our battery in. Battery cover just on the base plate here in the, in the finger grip. Standard 2CR5 battery, very common camera battery. Most Canon EOS film cameras run on them. Make sure you put the uh, terminals in first. Just show you that to be uh, extra clear. You want to get the silver contacts put in first. And away you go. Now in 1991, that was only four years after Canon had launched their first ever Canon EOS, the EOS 650. Uh, and Canon had done a number of cameras in the 600 range. The uh, 600, 620, 650, the RT, the 630 of course. Uh, and they all looked very much like this EOS 600. So as you can see, very angular straight lines. Uh, push buttons here, push buttons here, little secret hideaway flap with, you guessed it, more push buttons. Um, so that was a very distinctive shape, very distinctive character, and uh, all of these 600 series cameras are terrific. If you do go for a 650, make sure you get the one that has the GR20 grip on it, which has this uh, remote release socket on. Uh, the 650 didn't come without a standard. It came with a, a hand grip, of course, but it didn't have the remote release socket, just uh, to point that out. But that was the Canon EOS. And now in 1991, Canon suddenly decided to go all smooth and curvaceous and what have you. Um, round of grip here. We've moved away from so many push buttons. We've still got a couple lurking here by your thumb rests. Um, but Canon have moved over to the command dial, which became a hallmark of Canon cameras, um, sort of moving on from that point. The command dial is the main control of the camera. L is lock, uh, which used to mean off. Don't know what was wrong with off, but apparently it's lock. There we go. Um, the command dial is separated into basically two halves. This side with the pictograms, um, is what Canon call the program image control side and then on this side we've got increasingly varying degrees of manual control which Canon call the creative side. Uh, little LCD display on the right um, really a very simple little layout so let's go through some of these controls there is a weird thing about this camera. Normally with an SLR camera, your exposure mode, uh, your film transport, whether it's single shot or continuous winding, and your autofocus, again, whether it's continuous AF or one shot AF, that's normally, or those are things are normally set as three separate settings. On the 1000F, the film winding and the autofocus mode are tied into the exposure mode so you, you can't shoot in a different winding you can't have single shot winding for example if the exposure mode in use only has continuous which is a little bit weird I have to say so let's take a look at this so moving to the program image control the first setting is the green dot we get a very simple display on the top plate, just the shutter speed and the aperture. And of course we've got the battery condition there. Um, and that's basically program. Push the button, it takes a picture. I've got the lens set to manual, so it doesn't go whizzing in and out. Uh, but normally you'd have it on autofocus, of course. Now this is, let me see if I've got this right, one shot autofocus and single winding. 
So when we push the button, it'll take one picture and it won't take another picture until we push the button again. Because that is a program setting, people sometimes wonder what's the difference between that and the actual program mode. And as you can see on the LCD display, or maybe you can't, depends how the lighting is, you've got the shutter speed and the aperture, but you've now got an exposure compensation setting underneath. So a few things have changed at this point. Uh, we've gone to continuous winding. It'll keep taking pictures as long as you keep the button down. And continuous autofocus. So if your subject moves or you recompose, it will attempt to keep the subject in focus as it moves. As I say, this is the early days of EOS, the continuous autofocus was more a statement of intent than a practical mode of operation. But anyway, we've got continuous winding, uh, continuous autofocus, instead of single shot winding, single shot AF in the green square. But not only that, in the program mode, I can now access these secondary controls. So if I push this button on the left, I get exposure compensation. And if I push the button on the right, it uh, takes a partial exposure reading. So a standard, the camera has a three zone evaluative metering system. And bear in mind, our old friend the 600 range, that had a five zone evaluative metering system. So in some ways this is uh, taking a step back, but of course this was an entry level camera. Um, partial metering, middle line and a half percent, there's a circle engraved in the focus screen to tell you what you're metering from. That doesn't work in the green square mode. The exposure compensation doesn't work in the green square mode. Uh, the green square mode, as I'm calling it, can I actually call the green zone. Um, and if you push the, both the buttons together, you can dial in multiple exposures. And you can take... Well, in principle, you can take up to nine pictures on the same frame of film. In reality, when you get to frame number two, you can just dial in another nine if you wanted to. So that is resettable. Uh, equally, if you dial in a number of uh, oops, if you dial in a number of multiple exposures and you get it the wrong number you've dialed five and you only wanted two, you can, uh, if we take one picture, you can actually reset that to the number you want. Uh, so it's quite a handy feature. I quite like multiple exposure. It's quite a fun thing. Uh, the thing I most commonly use it for is you take a picture of a scene with the camera on a tripod, of course, and then using the self timer, you take a second picture of exactly the same scene but you've run around to the front of the camera and then you appear race-like in the frame, uh, which is quite fun. done that a few times in the past. Uh, it also has uh, more practical and, and uh, yeah, more practical and creative uses. But those are basically the differences between the program mode and the green zone mode. Uh, in program you get access to a little bit of um, extra features extra control over the exposure and uh, the multiple exposure function. There is one other thing you can do in the program mode that you can't do in the green zone mode. The camera features program shift. So if I turn this dial, uh, as standard the camera is saying use 250th f8, but if I want to increase my depth of field I can choose to override that and select a different exposure combination. It will still set the shutter speed and the aperture itself, but you can bias the uh, setting towards whatever you want to take a picture of. So let's move on. Back on the uh, program image control section. Um, portrait mode, very straightforward. Uh, Canon were one of the first companies to use what you might call pictograms. Um, obviously these, these cameras sell internationally and you couldn't write a little message on here, like port, apostrophe. 
because um, not everybody speaks English, or indeed if you wrote it in Japanese or um, or some other language, French perhaps, uh, not everybody would speak those languages. So um, they, they went in for these uh, pictograms. Portrait, so what does portrait give us? We get one shot autofocus, we get evaluative metering, and we got continuous winding. A little surprised about the continuous winding, but okay. Uh, moving on to landscape, still fully automatic. So this is basically a built-in expert. If you're taking landscape pictures, the camera is programmed to optimize the, the result for landscape or portrait or macro. Uh, landscape beginning again, one shot autofocus and evaluative metering, uh, but this time single shot winding. Moving on to macro, um, one shot. See, this is a little bit different. One shot autofocus, single frame winding, but now it's no longer using the evaluative metering system. It defaults to an evaluative metering system. Um, actually, I tell, I tell a lie. It defaults to the partial metering, the 9.5% partial metering in macro. And then finally, you've got the sport mode. Um, which is continuous, uh, continuous winding, uh, AI servo, continuous AF, and evaluative metering. Um, Canon used to call their continuous, and I believe they still do, their continuous autofocus mode AI servo focusing. Everybody else calls it continuous. So there we go, that's your built-in expert if you want to lend the camera to somebody that... Uh, just wants to take photographs and get a, you know, if you left it in green square, you get a perfectly good macro shot. But if you chose the macro mode, it would give you a, a slightly better macro shot, as though an experienced photographer had taken it. Then we've got the regular exposure modes on this side. I won't spend too much time on these. Um, if you were a keen photographer, you might want to know things like what focus mode you're in, what exposure mode you're using. So you're going to have to remember these as an EOS 1000F user. So, program. You've got AI servo focus, continuous winding, and evaluative metering. In time value, what used to be called shutter priority, you've got the same. AI servo autofocus, continuous winding, evaluative metering. Uh, once again in AV or aperture priority mode, you've got the same thing again. In manual, you've got uh, again AI continuous exposure, and I think it's one shot winding. That's um, no nope, continuous winding. That's how easy it is to to get these things controlled, uh, confused. So if you are in manual, and um, Let's just try the order for well that's not. Well let's try it. If we uh, try and lock focus on something. Everything's white and floodlit in here. Hmm. My notes say this is AI servo. So you would imagine that would refocus, but it appears to be one shot. So this idea of linking um, focus and metering and winding, film winding modes, to the exposure mode, it really just doesn't work. It's, it's, it's an inconvenience. I'm not quite sure why Canon went in for it. Um, but they did, and you know, that's fine. Um, I don't think anybody ever noticed at the time. I think people were just quite happy to get an autofocus camera to replace their old ME Super or OM10 or AE1 or whatever they might have been using. One thing Canon did pioneer with the EOS was the program depth. Um, program depth is very clever, uh, very useful, and not understood by people that bought the cameras as a rule. So you would, using the autofocus, focus on the nearest point you wanted sharp, focus on the farthest point you wanted sharp, recompose and take your picture. And it would choose an aperture and shutter speed combination to get that amount of depth of field, or as near to it as was possible. Now additionally, 
if you're in manual mode for example or time value or uh, aperture value the other way around you might want to use the self timer but you can't because the self timer is also on the command dial and if you're using the self timer you're using program exposure there's no choice that is the exposure mode for the self timer um, there is an ISO setting and the ISO range is 6 to 64,000 which can be selected manually it does have DX coding and the DX coding range is the full 25 to 5,000 uh, that most DX coded cameras will offer you uh, so that's pretty cool speaking of film loading let's go ahead and take a look inside the camera pretty standard fare for a autofocus SLR Ooh. Bit mucky in there. This does do something a little different though. So, firstly, let's load a film wrong. We get a little film cassette symbol, and as you can see, it's flashing to indicate there's a problem. So, straight away, we know there's a problem and it won't take a photograph. That is tremendous. Worth the price of admission just for that. A lot of cameras do that, of course, uh, of this sort of vintage. But uh, as I always say, if you don't load the film correctly, nothing else you do beyond that point is going to uh, achieve anything. Now, when we load the film correctly, you'll hear it whir away for a few moments. There we go. So now my cassette symbol isn't flashing and it's counted up to 23. And as I take photographs, it counts down 22, 21, and so on and so forth. So what the camera has done is it's wound all the film out of the cassette onto the take up spindle. And as you take each picture, it winds it back in to the film cassette. And this avoids one of the other classic errors people make, another way people lose their precious holiday photographs or whatever, opening the film back when there's still a film loaded. Um, if this was taking a picture and winding it onto the take-up spool, as was more common for a long time, that's your picture ruined. But because it's going the other way, you maybe lose one picture, the one that was here, but everything else is safely in here. The only thing you need to remember is to, to not continue taking pictures when you close the back again. This brings me on to another little gremlin about this camera. If I want to take the film out prematurely, because I've ruined it and I need to get it processed, you would normally see on the base plate a little button to rewind the film. But no. If you want to take the film out prematurely, you have to trip the shutter 20 odd times or however many times it is to get to the end of the roll. And there you have it. It winds the whoops, it winds the film leader into the cassette. So you can't now reload that film a second time by mistake. That's always quite a fun one. If you use the same film twice, you not only lose the first set of photographs you've taken, you also lose the second set. So there's a lot of good stuff about the way this uh, camera handles film. The, the not taking photographs if the film isn't loaded correctly, pre-winding the film so you don't ruin it if you open the camera back, and winding the leader into the film cassette. Um, you can forgive a camera a lot of uh, faults or a lot of idiosyncrasies uh, if it's got a good film transport mechanism. So that's the camera. Um, super popular when it was new. Um, sold loads and loads of these. As I say, you'll, you'll often see them with the 3580 lens. The 3580 was a lens that was, uh, let's say, made to a price so that uh, Canon could offer the camera with a, a zoom autofocus lens. At a, a keen price point. 
Uh, but in all honesty, it, it's not the best performing lens. If you uh, have a 50mm 1.8, uh, the Mark 1 or the Mark 2 both are excellent. The Mark 1s are now quite sought after and they go for fairly big money. But the Mark 2s uh, are still you know, very good value, still available new in actual fact. Other lenses to consider would be the 35 to 105, the 35 to 135, or the uh, slightly later 24 to 105. All uh, all excellent zoom lenses if you want a zoom lens. Of course, money no object. There's always the 28 to 70 or 24 to 70 L series as well, which will go on here and work quite happily. And there are any number of. Um, third-party lenses as well. I'm not sure I've mentioned this yet. One thing about 1000F, of course, is it does have a little pop-up flash in it. Now, I'm not uh, overly fond of these, but it's there. It can be handy at times. It does have the built-in autofocus illuminator, so it will help the camera achieve focus in low light. That's quite a nice touch. But there is one more little idiosyncrasy that... Uh, I think we should take a look at. So if I put this in, in manual, uh, and perhaps I should uh, just take a moment to explain how to use manual. So turning the dial changes the shutter speed, pushing the left hand button and turning the dial changes the aperture. So let's go into bold. So we can go all the way to 30 seconds uh, set manually and then bold. So when we press the button down the shutter stays open until we release it. So typically you might use this for star trails at night or um, trails of, of motor car headlamps and that sort of stuff going around roundabouts. Um, anything where you need to hold the shutter open for basically more than 30 seconds. Um, but obviously if you use the shutter release button you are going to jiggle the camera as you push it down and release it. So normally with the camera, as I mentioned on the 600 earlier, you would plug in a remote release or a cable release on older cameras and you would, you know, oops, let's just reset that. You would uh, push the plunger down or you push the uh, button on the electronic release and that would be how you'd avoid that. On the 1000F, there is no remote release socket. Um, if you wanted to use this for something like an A-level photography course, that is almost certainly going to be uh, a bit of a handicap. So just uh, bear that in mind. So, as popular as this was in 1991, is it a good choice today in, uh, in the 2000s? Well, with this one I paid uh, a little less than £10, including shipping, uh, and for £10 why not? You'd buy them all day long. Um, that being said, I see them selling uh, privately for anything up to around about £50. And in dealers, I see them for, you know, in nice condition with a lens, with a warranty, £75, £100. And for my, my, my money, that's, it's just too compromised a camera. Not being able to set your uh, focus mode or your exposure metering or your winding separate to your uh, exposure mode and not having a remote release it's it's just uh, too much of a compromise to pay big money for but sure if you've got you know an old 600 that I would rather have something like a 600 series uh, over and above the thousand F but if you've already got one of these or you've got a later EOS an EOS 5 and EOS 50 something like that uh, and you want a second camera, well, why not have one of these if you can get one at the right price? Certainly, if you've got one of the early 600 series, having uh, something like this is a nice juxtaposition with the difference in the style of bodywork. Um, anyway, this has been the EOS 1000F. Uh, I hope this video may be of use to somebody. Thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. Do have a good day.